My name is Katherine Rust. I am instructor for our um, Intro to Business class, and we are happy to have a communications class here as well, which is appropriate because our guest speakers are doing our um, two boomer babes from um, that are locally syndicated, were initially locally syndicated, and are now national. So our first speaker, though, is get the slide presentation working. Here it comes. <laughs> Mike Tilke from ESAC, from Eastern Shore Entrepreneurship Center. And we're very happy that he um, took some time today to come over to talk to you about his organization. So welcome, Mike. Have to remind me, this is the third year you've been doing this symposium? Probably, yes. Okay. I think that it's great uh, to be here for the third anniversary. Uh, I've been in, I think, at least one of the previous ones, if not the two. Um, so, I guess I want to ask a little bit about who I'm speaking to. There's a business class and a communications class. Business class, are you guys just learning about small business? Or do some of you have the idea that you're going to become entrepreneurs and do your own startups? Anybody out there? Many? Yes. One, two, three? Okay. You're today's American dreamers, okay? And it's really important that we nurture and encourage you guys to uh, pursue those kinds of, of opportunities. I think more so now than even when I was uh, out of school, uh, which was some time ago, entrepreneurship wasn't all that big a deal, um, but it is today. I think today's environment and, and economy uh, is just really ripe for offering good opportunities for people who, in many cases today, are solopreneurs. I don't know if you guys have worked with that word much in class, but many entrepreneurs kind of work by themselves on their own, uh, especially with today's new technology. It affords lots of opportunities for people to work either out of their home uh, or in co-working spaces, if you're familiar with that uh, terminology. Co-working spaces are kind of like what incubators used to be uh, a number of decades ago. Uh, co-working spaces are kind of like coffee house meets library. Uh, and it's a place where many of today's entrepreneurs sort of get together uh, in order to pursue their own business ideas or to collaborate. Um, and I guess my favorite new word these days is collision. I know when I was in school, the only types of collision that I ran across were those in science class uh, in which I was really poor. But in today's environment, we try to encourage entrepreneurs, people who are interested in new business ideas, to collide. That's today's new collision. Uh, so. Uh, in many cases, in my, uh, in my youth and during my midlife, it was all about networking. Entrepreneurs were always encouraged to network. Network's hard work. I hate it. I'm not into small talk. Um, I'm really uncomfortable in a lot of social situations. The reality is, though, don't think of it as network. It's not an effort anymore. It's about colliding. It's about the opportunity for entrepreneurs and people who have ideas to collide together, share ideas, and that's where new ideas come from. Uh, in many cases, I encourage a lot of you that, that want to pursue a, a business is to think about it as more of your product and service and the idea of it, the intellectual property of it. A lot of times, you're gonna, your most success is going to come from starting an idea, starting a business, and then selling it. You know, a lot of entrepreneurs today start businesses not with the intent that that's what they're going to do for the next 30 or 40 years. It's about starting something new, innovative, that some larger company, existing company, is going to want to buy and include in their portfolio of products and services they offer. So don't think of, of starting a business in the old traditional sense. Think about it in new paradigms. Uh, there are new ways of thinking about these things. So. Uh, again, I just encourage you to think about uh, colliding and thinking of different ways to pursue entrepreneurship beyond just the traditional. Now, as an entrepreneur, I would be remiss if I didn't mention just briefly my sales pitch about the Entrepreneurship Center. Uh, I'm the executive director. Uh, the center started in 2006. We do primarily three things. Uh, similar to the Small Business Development Center that's on, here, on campus here, uh, we do technical assistance. 
we meet with one-on-one -on -one with, with entrepreneurs and provide business coaching uh, and counseling in order to sort of help develop ideas, uh, develop and, and, and sort of refine business plans, uh, and help entrepreneurs get started or expand uh, a business. The second thing we do is entrepreneurship training. Uh, I'm going to leave these uh, on the, the foot of the stage when I leave. Um, they're basically rack cards. You already may know about the course we offer here at Chesapeake uh, through the course catalog. But twice a year, once at Chesapeake College and once at Warwick Community College, we offer a 10-week entrepreneurship training course. It's serious entrepreneurship. Um, it's basically an MBA course in 10 weeks. But it's all practical. It's not theoretical. And so we have probably 15 to 25 people that take the course every year. And it's as much about learning what you don't know about starting a new business as it is a personal growth kind of thing. Uh, it teaches you about start to finish about how a company runs, how a business operates. And if for no other reason than helping you start a business, it may also help you be a better employee. You know, a lot of times people take the course and they start out thinking they want to start a business, but once they realize what it involves, what the personal characteristics of a successful entrepreneur are, uh, what the sacrifices that are going to be necessary to be a success as a, a business owner, uh, they decide that's not what they want to do. But they're a much better employee because now they understand the big picture. You know, the, the, the boss, when they make the kinds of decisions they make, aren't just jerks. They're making their business uh, decisions based on sound reasoning for a financial re, uh, purpose. So uh, it makes you a, a better employee of, as far as what you can contribute uh, to the success of the business. Uh, it makes you able to be what's uh, a new word for you maybe is intrapreneurial, where you're able to be entrepreneurial but within the structure of a larger company. The third thing we do is revolving loan fund portfolio. Uh, a lot of times, especially today, since 2008, many people wanting to start a business or grow a business aren't able to get a traditional bank loan. Um, you know, the federal regulations have gotten a lot more strict, a lot more severe, so it's a real uphill battle for a lot of business owners to get loans from banks. So, the revolving loan fund is a, tr is a non-traditional way to get a loan. Um, our interest rates are lower. Um, the hill to climb is a lot easier. My loan review committee tends to invent, uh, invest in people more so than uh, collateral um, that, a, that a person and oftentimes with a bank needs to walk in the door with. Um, so we're willing to take greater risk, a risk uh, with a lot of entrepreneurs that banks aren't um, willing or able to do so. So that's the third thing we do. So for those of you that are interested in starting a business, solid business plan, we're available to help you with, with financing. Uh, for example, one of your uh, speakers uh, in a moment, your husband is a loan client, Kathy's uh, uh, husband is a loan client. Um, and then there's um, a previous speaker, I think, who was going to be here. She's also a loan client. So we're working with a lot of existing entrepreneurs here in the area. And so I will also leave business cards uh, down at the foot of the uh, stage. And those of you who are interested in either taking the course or talking to me uh, and reaching out for some advice or counsel, we're happy to do it. So I don't know if you want to entertain questions now or wait till later. Does anybody have any questions? I don't know that I'm the, the primary speaker today, so yes. No, it's, it's part of the continuing ed. Okay, I'm sorry, the question was, uh, basically, could the course go towards your, your credits? It's not a credit course. It's part of the continuing ed course, or d division. Um, so I, don't, I doubt that it would. Um, but the one thing to keep in mind that I didn't mention is the course is $295, but if you attend no less than eight of 10 sessions and submit a minimum of a two-page executive summary at the end of the, the 10 sessions, you get a 100% refund. I have a foundation that underwrites this. So your skin in the game is attend, benefit, and show that you learned something from the course. Whether you start a business is unimportant. We just want the opportunity to broaden your perspective of thinking about entrepreneurship. So you're eligible for a 100% refund. But thank you for the question. Any others? Yes? Are there any skills or uh, 
Right. No, the, the interesting, oh, I'm sorry, repeat the question. Are there any skill sets or, or uh, personal traits that, that you need to have uh, in order to take the course? The interesting thing that we try to get most people to understand, uh, this course is a very interactive course. It's not a teacher-student relationship, it's facilitator-participant. Um, and so we have a lot of uh, existing entrepreneurs and business leaders who help facilitate uh, each of the sessions. The thing that's important is that whoever attends the course is an active participant in the course. Everyone brings life experience to the course. And that life experience contributes to an entrepreneurial dialogue. You guys know more instinctively what, what sells, what doesn't sell. You know, you're, you're, you're all consumers of one sort or another. So you know what works for you and what doesn't. You know, how, what target market am I a member of? Uh, what kind of products and services speak to me? What's the value in the pro product? What's the value proposition that's motivating me to want to spend money for that product and service? So a lot of you, through your life experience, are able to contribute to the conversation. So is there any special expertise? No. Um, you all have something to contribute, and it's amazing what you can learn from each other. And again, another aspect of the course is it's a room filled with people who are budding entrepreneurs that you're colliding with, you're networking with, and a lot of times you stay in touch with. Because if you tend to start a business, you want to have somebody else that you can collaborate with and go, you know, I'm really struggling with this. What is it you do with your business in order to overcome this particular object objective or, I'm sorry, objection uh, to whatever the situation is. So, you just value, you, you, you benefit from each other uh, measurably. Anything else? Yes? Do you um, have expertise with patent laws, copyright laws, trade laws? Um, okay, do I have any expertise with intellectual property and patent laws? Uh, again, the, the, the answer I give is as an entrepreneur, it's really important to know what you don't know. That's something that I'm no expert at. Um, that, those resources are available, um, so we tend to refer uh, people to who are the experts, whether it's a patent attorney uh, or someone else. Uh, I know the University of Maryland uh, Patent um, Law Center uh, provides free counseling to entrepreneurs. Uh, for those kinds of questions, and we're trying to attract more of that expertise to the Eastern Shore so that people do understand how to package. A lot of times people just don't think they have any intellectual property associated with their product or service, when in reality they do, uh, and they need to protect it. Um, one other thing, though, I will mention to you about patents is a lot of times people think if they have a patent, that means no one can copy what they do, and that's not what it means. What it means is, is that anybody can copy anybody else. All the patent gives you is the opportunity and the right to sue that person for having copied. And so just because you have a patent doesn't guarantee that someone won't steal your idea. It just affords you the, the legal um, mechanism uh, to pursue. The other question you have oftentimes today is do I have the capacity to enforce my patent? Do I have deep pockets in order to pay a lot of legal fees in order to enforce my patent? A lot of times the answer people come up with is no. So that's the reason in today's environment you have a lot more open source activity on the internet. People don't patent, they just think that the better option for them is to throw it on the internet so it's open source and move on. It, you know, most things today only have a six month shelf life. When you're talking especially technology, it's moving so fast, it doesn't make any sense to patent some intellectual property. So that's why a lot of entrepreneurs and, and developers and designers are just throwing their stuff up on the internet uh, in an open source environment because they want to then focus on the next new idea, the next new thing they're going to develop. Yes? Okay, so what would you suggest, like, if you do have an idea, what steps do you want to take in order to make sure your ideas doesn't get It depends on what it is the idea is, um, but more times than not, it's first to market. You know, keep your idea relatively um, to yourself, 
develop a business idea, and if you do discuss it with people like a business coach or other kinds of, of experts that you want to help develop your, your, your idea, make them sign a non-disclosure form. Don't hesitate to, when you want to talk to people uh, to have them sign uh, a form that says that they won't disclose or share uh, the content of your conversation. Um, the other thing is when you talk to people about your ideas, talk about it in generalities, in terms of what the values are, uh, what the benefits are of your idea, but don't tell them the secret sauce. Keep it to yourself. I don't want to take time away from Kathy and Barbara, so I'm going to just turn it over and thank you for allowing me to say a few words. Thank you very much, Mike. Talk about networking. Six years ago, I was in a Pilates class, and I met uh, one of the speakers, Kathy Bernard. And it was during a recent Pilates class that um, we connected again, and uh, we started talking about what each of us are doing. And it was because of that conversation um, that we decided that it would be a good opportunity for her to come and speak. So without further ado, I would like to invite um, Kathy Bernard and Barbara Klein from Two Boomer Babes up here to share their story, their success story. Come on up. Share Kathy's comment to Mike. We should have taken your class first. Yes. <laughs> I think we could have avoided a lot of you bumps balls. along the way yeah. if we uh, signed up. Oh well, but that's on you. We are always right. a day late and a dollar short. But that's how it sort goes. Sort of our mantra. <laughs> well, we want to thank you so much for joining us today, and we are delighted to be here amongst you, students, esteemed students, esteemed teachers at Chesapeake College, and we just have a feeling that we Boomer Babes might learn a thing or three from you guys. So have you all ever had a wild or crazy thought, an idea, perhaps something that you think, you know what, this just might be the big one, or just what we like to call a harebrained idea? Well, think about it. We usually get these in the middle of the night. It's usually around 3 or 3.30 in the morning. You know, we kind of wake up, both of us will chit-chat about it the next day and be like, wow, this would be fantastic. Oh my gosh. Go back to sleep, you wake up, and then you realize what you thought of at 3.30 in the morning was like, horrible. What a horrible idea. And thank God we didn't go that way. And I haven't even told you about the horrible idea I had last I night, but that's wait. later. <laughs> Okay, so what Kathy and I want to share with you today is our wild and crazy journey in the radio business. How we became almost accidental entrepreneurs, starting something out of nothing except what we thought was kind of a brilliant idea stemming from our own life experiences at the time. And it wasn't even in the middle of the night. How do you like that yeah, one? Can you imagine? So we want to just take you on a little bit of our ride. Barbara and I are very dear longtime friends with very different professional backgrounds, actually. But we really are living proof that a germ of an idea can take you on a wild ride and lead you to very unexpected but most exciting places. And funny enough, and I think this is really true of other entrepreneurs, we're still on that wild ride. And in a year or two, we just might be headed in another direction as our show really continues to morph. And you just never know. And that's really the joy of being an entrepreneur. So if you'll bear with us, here's our abbreviated version of our wild ride with some of the twists, the, tour, the turns, the detours, and the flat tires that we've learned along the way. You know that old adage, be careful what you wish for? Have you ever heard that one? Well, we'd like to take you back up 20 years. Both of our families had been posted overseas, and we each returned back to the United States with two precious little girls in tow. And that's where we kind of met each other. We became fast friends. 
where many friendships are made in preschool. Not our preschool, but our little girl's preschool. And with that time, what Barbara and I discovered, and you, I know you can't believe it now because there's so much information everywhere, but at that time, it was really hard to kind of navigate what was going on and what to do with our kids in the Washington, D.C. area. There just wasn't that flow of information. So Kathy came up with this harebrained idea, and you're going to see that this is a general theme within this conversation, of doing a television show. And this was years ago. Now, thinking I was humoring her, I went along, and the next thing you know, we had a show called Our Kids on a local cable station, actually on two local cable channels, yeah. and starring who else are kids. I mean, after all, they were cheap labor, and we didn't even need a babysitter. <laughs> so you guys are really young, so you probably don't even remember that cable actually didn't start that long ago. And do you even remember when cable first began? Probably not. But you were probably, you know, at the time, you know, you probably don't even really remember when there wasn't even Wi-Fi or clouds, whatever the heck clouds are. Well, back in the day, we're sounding very old, you know, cable companies cropped up, and they would have taken anyone, and I'm telling you, anyone with a pulse that had an idea because you know what they needed? They needed content. They were on air and they needed a, a void. They needed to fill a void. So Barbara and I came up with this idea, created a program, and the coolest thing was that we actually won an ACE award for best new show. Well, we were probably the only new show, but we did win the award, and we promised we didn't even ask our friends and relatives to stuff the ballot box. Well, maybe a few kids. Well, a couple, but we still won. <laughs> so after 15 episodes of this wild ride, and a year plus later, job opportunities moved my family uh, to the Eastern Shore. And you know, I still haven't forgiven her. My memory's fading, but I still haven't forgiven her for that one. So we zoom ahead 20 years, and throughout the time, our kids remain the best of friends, and you know, our, we have two girls each, which is not easy, and uh, we, they were all going through the same teenage pain, so the boyfriends and the school decisions, and then poof, suddenly, like you guys, they're off to college, and we both have empty nests. So for me, that empty nest, and maybe some of your moms are going through the same thing, was absolutely gut-wrenching. My kids went quite far away to school, one in New Orleans and one in St. Louis, so it wasn't just around the corner. When we dropped our youngest off, oh my gosh, I was devastated. I think I cried for 400 miles through three states, my poor husband. But then, all of a sudden, an epiphany struck. And it was like empty nesting. Wait a minute. You know, this is just one small part of this whole new life venture we are about to begin without our children. We're going to rediscover relationships, our husbands, you know, and, and think back. We did this to our own parents. So really it's kind of sweet revenge. So I started thinking, you know what, this is an opportunity to embrace the challenges of midlife. Aging parents, and let's not forget college tuition, and maybe grown kids coming back and living in our basements. Oh my God. If we're lucky enough to have basements. Mm -hmm. We truly are the sandwich generation. And what it is, is it's an opportunity for a new life venture. And at that point, we said, aha, this really is an aha moment. So what did I do? I called my dearest friend, Barbara, because I just knew she'd understand. And you know, my reaction to my kids leaving home, leaving for college, was a little bit different. I was like, Yahoo! You know, I'm going to turn their bedroom into my gym or my home office. And I actually went out and I bought a brand new couch that nobody under 18 had ever sat on and had no crumbs anywhere. No kids to stay. Nothing. And I was actually enjoying my newfound peace and quiet. And at the same time, like a lot of midlifers, I was in the throes. My mother had just passed away, and I was mourning my mother. And I wasn't really looking for a new adventure. But just like always, Kathy has this rather per persuasive way about her. And I found myself asking, what has she wrote me into this time? Well, our gut, and that's another theme here, told us that there really was a hunger for a platform providing great information, conversation, something to really stimulate the brain. 
to highlight the endless opportunities that are ahead of us. We're not stopping. We're moving on. And, you know, at the same time, we can kind of poke fun at ourselves, the foibles of middle age, and laughing a whole lot along the way. So we did what any self-respecting, budding entrepreneur would do. We did our homework. We began researching. We began Googling. We began looking for who is hosting that boomer conversation. After all, there are 78 million of us out there. That's a lot of people. And you know, we thought somebody must be doing it, but we wanted somebody like us. Not the Oprah's, not the Jane Pauleys of the world, just everyday people living the moment. So we really started honing in on our niche. We began to blog, we began to write columns, and then it just hit us. This is perfect for a radio show. But you know, we don't let trite little details get in our way like no one's going to write and maybe even produce a radio show. I mean, after all, how hard can that be? And then of course, and this is a big thing here, luck and being in the right place at the right time really does play a, look, play a role. And of course, divine intervention doesn't help either. And miracles of miracles, we will quickly picked up by public radio affiliates along the East Coast at the Delmarva uh, Public Radio. And last year, another miracle. We signed a national deal with AARP um, with 40 million members. They are actually the lo largest lobbying organization in the United States, and they have the largest radio and production studios in the Washington, D.C. area. They actually interviewed President Obama there. I mean, they're, they're big time. They're the, the latest in technology. And we were so thrilled. But of course, you all, I know you know, we are way too young to even be members of that organization. But they came on board as not only the producer of our show, so it's really top-notch talent that could really help perk us up a bit, but they came on board as a major sponsor, which was, was really huge. In addition to NPR affiliates, we're now nationally syndicated on Sirius XM, major cable networks, apps galore like iHeart, iTunes, Stitcher, and many more that we don't even pretend to understand. And then we're told that actually our show now reaches over 40 million households, and we hope they didn't add an extra zero by mistake, but we'll never tell. <laughs> so we banks make it our mission to talk about real-life issues facing our target audience, those in midlife, the good, the bad, the ugly, and the funny. The feedback we receive from our listeners has been critical to our growth. And together with our sponsors, they are our customers, the lifeblood of our show and our business. And quite honestly, we've actually been shocked by the response. This idea has morphed in ways that we could never have predicted. And that's kind of the lesson that we learned. We discovered that to be successful, entrepreneurs need to constantly bend and flex. And as luck would have it again, and much luck goes into it, we've won the coveted Associated Press Award for Outstanding Talk Show for the last three years. Recently, USA Today named our website, twoboomerbabes.com, a top boomer website. It actually crashed our website <laughs> after that was published. And the show was named nationally one of the top five media offerings for boomers. And get this, right next to Jane Pauley. Okay, we're almost done bragging, but to top it <laughs> off, have you ever heard of Emmys, Grammys, or Oscars? Anybody? Yes. <laughs> well, we just won a Gracie Award, which is an award by women in the media. And it's a pretty big deal, we thought. And we can't wait to hold that little babe. It's a actual statue, a golden statue of a woman. In our hot little hands, and I guess, Kathy, we're going to have to share custody on we're the weekend. share. Yeah, but she'll like my house because I'm going to take her sailing on the weekends. <laughs> But seriously, we'd like to let you in on a little secret. We had an idea. We developed a business plan. We created financials. We pitched a concept. We landed a station and our very first major sponsor. Barbara and I saw an opportunity, and we just went with it. From day one, we have organically grown our business through our own sweat equity, sales of sponsorship, and without one dollar of debt. So we stand before you as a living, although slightly exhausted testament, that age is no barrier. You're never too old to become an entrepreneur and follow your passion. 
but with a plan. So while at this moment in time, you may think that accounting or marketing or perhaps public relations or writing, that that may really be your thing, and maybe it will be. But you also might get into it and think, you know what, this isn't really what I want to do. So you may have to kind of, you know, go with the flow and figure it out. And you may discover along the way that you'd rather be a zookeeper or an innkeeper or perhaps an undertaker. Okay, a little segue here, speaking of undertakers. There's a lot of room for you women out there in the undertaking business. Because we just interviewed an undertaker who is very multi-talented. <laughs> In her spare time from dealing with the dead, she also poses for Playboy. How do you like that one? I mean, talk about a yeah. side gig, right? But as a mother of two daughters, we are not recommending that approach at all. But she certainly is an example of somebody that really found her niche. <laughs> so now, we'd like to share with you three of our very favorite interviews with entrepreneurs who believe, you know, we really believe that they are great examples of individuals who have taken an idea and they run with it. Okay, so you've probably heard the old saying, crime does not pay. But occasionally, crime does pay. Take Larry Levine, for example, who we interviewed a while back. Larry has parlayed his very long rap sheet and 10-year prison stint into a thriving business, prison consulting. Okay, so this is Larry's <laughs> business model. It's true. It's true. <laughs> For a big fat fee, he counsels his clients, who just happen to be convict convicted felons, about prison etiquette, how to transfer to another presumably nicer prison, and some medical issues. And he also offers a class called, I thought this was brilliant, Bedtime 101, <laughs> to those about to do jail time, which we hear is very popular. And guess what? You don't have to do any homework in the class. And Larry tells us that there's lots of competition out there because a lot of ex-cons want to get back into this business and, uh, and open up their own consulting firm. And we asked him, okay, Larry, how do you keep your competitive edge? Well, guess what he said? Social media, of course. <laughs> of course. You know? And, you know, in his vast experience also, he has spent time in 11 prisons over a 10-year period, including low, medium, and high security. He told us the high security was for machine gun weapon charges. Um, so, with his vast experience, I mean, that really gives him a leg up. Now, we babes want to be very clear. We're not <laughs> advocating you go out and rob a bank and turn it into a financial consulting business. Nothing like that. We just want to show you that out of adversity, like Larry, a successful business can be born. And then there's Julie Allenson, who went looking for a pair of reading glasses and found that her choices were very, very limited. There were the high-end, very expensive optical kind of readers, or the cheapo Walgreens brand, and they just didn't, they, would, they wouldn't do for her. So through Julie's own personal quest to find a product, this innovative boomer discovered a void in the marketplace and an opportunity to do what? To create a business. So she started manufacturing fashionable, high-quality reading glasses at middle-of-the-road price points. After all, every eight seconds, someone turns 40, which means there's a lot of blurred vision out there. So we babes learned a whole lot from Julie. First of all, she did her homework. Before she took the plunge and invested her life savings to pursue the creation of iBobs. Has anyone ever heard of iBobs? These really funky readers. She traveled to China to check out manufacturing. She traveled to, um, to uh, Italy to check out lenses and frames. She did not rely on a middleman. She built her own relationships with her suppliers. Her road was not an easy one, but she kept her eye on the ball or the frames and her eye on finances. In her words, cash flow is king. Another valuable lesson we learned from the iBob story is that where you think your product or your idea is a perfect fit just may not be the case. For Julie, she thought it was a slam dunk that her readers would be sold through optical stores. Well, guess what happened? The opticians ended up placing her readers out of sight because they became competition for their higher-end glasses that they wanted to sell. 
But as luck would have it, Julie knew a guy who owned a men's clothing store, and he took on her line and quickly sold out. She hit a gold mine, men and women's fashion accessories. Julie landed deals with Nordstrom, Neiman Marcus, Orvis, and boutiques all across the country. The final takeaway to the story is it is said that imitation is the best compliment of all. But with all of iBob's success, copycats, i.e. cheaper versions, began to crop up everywhere. So Julie had to create demand for her brand, the real thing, to keep her competitive advantage. What did she do? She added value to her product. Exclusive iBob glass cases with every pair. It worked. And now, 14 years later, she's an immensely successful, inspiring, and wealthy entrepreneur. So another of our all-time favorite interviews was with a guy named Brian Johnson, an all-around fabulous guy whose day job is records manager in Washington, D.C.'s District Federal Court. But by night, he's the personal trainer to Supreme Court Justices Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Elena Kagan. But if you ever wonder why they look so good, it's because of this guy. So how on earth did this guy get this gig? Okay, well, Brian was always into fitness, and he had done a very long stint in the military um, before coming to the court. And he began to train a few of his colleagues, did a wonderful job, and they started looking pretty buff, word got around, and then he got the call from the Supreme Court. He had hit Pager. <laughs> and he asked Brian, if it's intimidating to train these, you know, Supreme Court justices, I mean, after all, they're used to telling other people what to do. But Brian said it's all equal in the gym, and the Supreme sweat just like the rest of us. And Kathy and I were dying to know if Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Elaine Kane Kagan, you know, sort of couldn't imagine it, but did they wear sneakers and sweats, or did they wear spandex? And he let us know <laughs> that a little spandex is involved, and, you know, we thought good for them. And word spread very quickly, and Brian's success with the Supremes has led to lots of other problems. So the bottom line is, Brian took a passion, he found a niche, and with a combination of really being in the right place at the right time, a very winning personality and drive, he's now realizing his dream of a very successful full-time training business. So we've talked your ear off for sure, and it's time to close, but we'd like to leave you with one final thought. Although you might not always think it, the world really is your oyster, and there are endless opportunities out there for the taking. You just have to have the drive, the passion, and the guts to go grab them. And while not everybody gets rich with their venture, you might not be living in a mansion or sailing on your 100-foot yacht, we guarantee you it's really an incredible feeling to create something from scratch and to help it evolve and grow and watch it. And it's totally liberating, I have to say, to be in control of your own destiny. So finally, and this is finally, we'd like to leave you with our top takeaways from the Babe School of Hard Knocks. First, don't become a victim of paralysis with analysis. Do your homework as best you can. But know that you don't have the resources of a Fortune 500. You're not going to know everything. If you're waiting to do so, you will never move forward. Learn to trust your gut. Okay, next, balance your personal life with your professional life. You have to turn it off, even if it's for a night, to refresh and to re-energize. Take a walk, go for a hike, go out for dinner, take a hot shower, watch something really dumb on TV. It works wonders. Then, as an entrepreneur, you're going to face a lot of rejection and a lot of criticism. We sure have. We're a testament to it. So get used to it. But do something you enjoy, you're passionate about, because believing in what you're doing will get you through all the tough times. Plus, think of this. Two inches wide, two miles deep. What does that mean? It means focus. What's your niche? What void are you filling? Don't try to be all things to all people. And listen until it hurts. Listen to your customers. They're going to tell you. 
and in not so many words, actually how to grow your business. What you may think is a great idea or a great flavor may not really appeal to them. So be flexible. They may also lead you in a direction that was never on your radar screen. Take small, take small steps, but grow with each and every one. And finally, along that vein, be open, because you're probably going to end up someplace different from where you started. Be certainly different. Successful entrepreneurs learn from their ideas, their passion, their hard knocks. They learn lessons from their peers and from their customers. They flex and they find their niche, and they fill a void, and they do it really well. But now, we've got to run. And like all entrepreneurs, we babes have a very busy day ahead of us. We're feeling really lucky, so we're going to buy our lottery tickets before we head to the studio in D.C. to produce the show, and then we've got to hit boxing class before our Habitat home build. And then we'll head on over to the food bank to drop off some donations. We'll stop by the retirement center to visit with our elderly relatives. And then we'll go attend our organic gardens. We'll prepare cocktails for 40. We got a blog. We have to answer our emails. We'll grab a bite at the local bistro with our hubbies. And we'll stop by the investment club, head for a midnight swim in our new bikinis. Well, maybe <laughs> Kathy will. We'll jump in the jacuzzi. We'll light the candles. And then, drum roll, dream up the next big business venture. Thank you all for joining us. Where? The Juice River Bay. We'd love to take any questions or. Yes, Kathy. I have a burning question, but if you could repeat my question. Yes. Okay. Um, I don't understand the radio business. And so we've got a communications class, and here, I, I can't even conceive the idea of how you would thought your show would be taken. And you started, I guess, at WCDO. And how did that whole thing work? You could explain that to me. How you became that regional, then national, and how does anybody, how does that work? Did you it, it was a miracle. But we can <laughs> you can do the question first, Susan. What Kathy's question was, how did we take a little um, idea of a radio show, launch it on a local station, and have it actually grow to a national audience? Barbara, you want to take Ooh, that? Oh, <laughs> that makes three of us who don't understand. Well, <laughs> well, I'll tell like you. history of radio, too. Yeah, yeah well, we started out at WCEI, you all probably know that station. And actually, we approached the station manager, who happened to be a middle-aged woman, and we were telling her this germ of an idea, and she instantly got it. And so she, lo and behold, said that she would put us on the lineup. And I said to Kathy, I'm not doing this unless we get a sponsor. So Kathy had a contact over at Shore Health, who became, and we, we met with this woman, who again, it was, talk about luck. She happened to be this wonderful middle-aged woman, a boomer, who instantly got what we were trying to do. And she said, within five minutes, I'll sponsor you. And I'm putting Kathy under the table thinking, don't we have to come back five times, you know, before somebody agrees to sponsor us? So with, in that moment, when they agreed to sponsor us, they paid for all our expenses. We actually, we were in the black immediately, which is very unusual, actually, for a small business. And then we actually had a contact. You tell about the, the Del Marble Public well, Radio. So, you know, living in a small town, you all know how that is. You network and network like crazy. Network everywhere. Or what is your great word? Collide. 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 We collide, clash, collide. We do everything. <laughs> well, this, this show took off, Little Easton. And the next thing you know, we were really, uh, we had the ear of NPR affiliates, Delmarva Public Radio. They are affiliate members of National Public Radio. They approached us and they said, why don't you move to our studios, we'll produce you, and we will put you on NPR. We were like, oh no, we can't do that. No, seriously, we were like, woo, you know. <laughs> so, we then moved, our production moved to Salisbury University. Quit our day job. Oh yeah, we, we quit our day job. Because that. that is a huge launch in the radio world. Even though we were on these small affiliates on the shores, it was enormous. Well, about... A year and a half after that, later, we've only been doing this five years, six months. Uh, maybe two years. Yeah, but yeah, two years. Yeah, but yeah, two years yeah, later. Yeah, yeah. From NPR affiliates 
lo and behold, we clashed, we collided, we did whatever we did, and um, we got the ear of this huge national sponsor and landed that deal, national deal. So we moved production to their national studios. They are a production facility. They are not a distribution facility. But our national contract is that they are the producers of our program and they're the distributors of our program. So we are now in distributions via NPR, Sirius XM, uh, CRN Network, iHeartRadio, Stitchers, iTunes, I don't know, a million other things. Bottom line is we're now reaching 40 million households. So production is sort of one element, distribution is another. They're very, two different businesses that work together. And another, I don't want to involve the other questions, but the um, other thing is, how do you, so now your initial audience, you were targeting the AARP audience. No, we never them. thought we were old enough to target it. <laughs> so, yeah. No, yeah, like no, no, 45 plus. No, our started. idea was to appeal to the younger end of the AARP members to get to be 50 and over. But right. our idea is, when you look at the old AARP, I don't know if any of you know this, but they were really sort of appealing to more of the 70s, 60s, 70s, 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 50, 60, 70 year olds aren't going to go off into the sunset and go to Florida and play golf all day. They want to reinvent themselves. They might want a second career. They might want to go find these fabulous volunteer opportunities. They're not just going to sit back. So they're trying to make themselves, they're reinventing themselves actually. So, what are some of the topics that you discuss? What we yeah. discuss everything from, as we said, empty nesting to finance to, to health. To sex. Like the recent health point that you did. You did um, a long series. Oh, oh wow. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, that's a, okay. So we recently, a lot of what we do is things that we're interested in and we believe our listeners and we get tons of feedback. We get great emails constantly kind of flowing in so we know we're on a good path. Um, living the moment, Barbara's dear wonderful father. Um, had Alzheimer's disease. And we realized this crazy life we were leading because we're in production in Washington. We go into these gleaming third floor studios. You just can't imagine what they look like. It is so cool. I wish we all could come and, and take a field trip and take a tour. It's just awesome. And we would go from the third floor of this experience to the third floor of Sunrise Assisted Living where her dad was a patient was a resident. And we would look at each other, we'd bring our laptops and we'd be working on our show and all these different Alzheimer's residents would be sort of sitting with us and helping us navigate what we were going to do the following week. But we realized there was a bigger story to tell. So we uh, pitched it and launched an eight-part series. And it was called, it's called Beyond the Face of Alzheimer's. And it captures very different um, scenarios and stories of the people who are afflicted and the people who are behind them picking up the pieces. And uh, that's what we recently won this Gracie Award for, which is just a huge major deal. So, But that's an example of we did what we knew. We did what we were experiencing, experiencing and going through. And that's the reason that we really came up with this idea. From all, every segment that we do, basically, is sort of from our own experience or <coughs> what our audience is telling us that they're going through. So we're not, it's not being made up in, out of thin air. It's really from what we're experiencing. Yes. Okay, um, like times where, I'm pretty sure what an advocate of being starts to get down on themselves when you get like so many like rejections and stuff. I'm like, what motivates you out of like pushing and like this is going for you? Can you repeat the question? You were asking what motivated us to keep going, even if we might have gotten some rejection or some criticism. What made it? What motivated us to keep going? You know, I think Kathy and I knew 
we had an idea that was a little bit different because, like you said, we really did do our homework. There was nothing out there that was really speaking strictly to boomers. Sort of that 45 to, you know, maybe 70, 65. We're, we're very flexible with our definition, but sort of midlife group. So um, we really were convinced that we were onto something here. And, um, you know, a, a case in point is the first station that we went to, the woman said, we sound too Midwestern. You're never going to make it in the radio business with that nasal A and the, you know, the. Thanks yes. who she was talking. No, they brought in voice coaches <laughs> for us. Voice coach. It got worse. Yeah, it made it totally the worse. The more they had us practicing, the worse it got. <laughs> and we thought, you know what? We're not trying to be like Kathy said, like a Jane Paul. Like, we are who we are. We're kind of like the everyday person living the moment. We're not movie stars, clearly. You know, we're not, you know, starlets. So we were really convinced that there wasn't, there was a void. I mean, there really was a need for somebody like us to sort of spread the word about these issues. And I think to, to further answer your question about how you can really get down in the dumps, for sure, because it's hard to take rejection. It's hard to take criticism. I think it helps that we are together. And it also helps you've got to surround yourself. If it's just it's one person or two people, if it's a mentor, if it's your best friend, if it's your spouse, if it's your brother, your sister, if it's someone you can bounce things off of because you need that outlet. So we've had each other, we've had our spouses, we've had our families. And so when things like that happen, it ends up turning into a lot of laughter because like the whole voice coaching thing, we absolutely love. Right, <laughs> so. right, right. We also had a man when we first started this that told us nobody wants to listen to middle-aged women. You know, the, the, the um, demographic now is for the 18 to 24 year olds. Nobody wants to sponsor that, that demographic. But guess what? We did our homework again, and it's our age group that really has the, we, we make the buying decisions. And who has the deep pockets? Anybody can answer that? Boomers. Relatively speaking. A million people with the money in their pockets. So in terms of appealing to advertisers, a, a show that would appeal to boomers, the advertisers are very appealing to them because they want to reach the demographic. So my message is you got to listen to people, but you also got to be stubborn, too. And Kathy knows this a lot for working with me. I mean, you just got to go with your gut, too. <laughs> <laughs> yes. What was the hardest obstacle you had to like, overcome in like, the past five years? What was the hardest obstacle we had to overcome over the last five years? Wow, there's been so many. <laughs> like, which Let's one do we put first? Let's see. Um, you know, I think it's kind of the, um, the distribution versus the sponsorship, because you have to have a distribution in order, you have to show them the numbers in order to get sponsors. And sometimes you have to have sponsors in order to this, you know, get a broader distribution of the show. So it's kind of balancing that. And we, you know, sometimes we've been ahead, sometimes we've been a little bit behind. But I think on average, we've been able to even it out. But that's really what makes the show, you know, move forward, is that balance of distribution. Yeah. Yes. And uh, how, how old will we uh, be able to do your show? Well, if you guys are so mobile with your apps, D of iHeart on your, you can just go to Boomer Bay, the number two Boomer Bay on iHeart Radio is probably the easiest. Go to our website, to boomerbay.com. We are on Sirius XM. I was actually listening to us when I was driving up to the college. I hit Sirius on. I'm like, gosh, it sounds so familiar. I think we did that same interview. And then I realized it was us, <laughs> which is always great fun. Um, and we're also on um, 890.7 and 89.5 here on the shore, NPR on Saturdays. Right, and iTunes. iTunes, iTunes yeah. Today. There's There's lots of ways. Thank you. I hope you tune in. You might be one of the youngest listening members of our audience. <laughs> That's good. That'd be fabulous. We'll put you on our website. <laughs> We're expanding our reach. <laughs> How old are you? 24. Oh, okay. Perfect. He just asked if he could like you on Facebook. Please oh, yes. do. Oh, yes. 
<laughs> and we treat, with oh, us we too. treat and two boomer bangs. <laughs> and it's uh, two boomer bangs with an exclamation point. And that's another story. So. So oh, we oh, are. We are. are. <laughs> now, don't ask us what yeah. that means. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we do. Thank you. Please do. Did you? Yes. How do we find our topics and has it been influenced moving from a local regional area to a national area or and or influenced by um, advertisers? Great question. Well, I can tell you what we stay away from. The one thing we do try to stay away from is politics and religion. That's the one thing we do. But everything else is really fair game. And, you know, we read a lot. Um, we get, we develop relationships now with lots of publicists, and they send up us the latest, you know, books. And believe me, we have stacks oh my and gosh. stacks and stacks. We books. actually donate a lot of books to Chesapeake College. Yeah, oh my goodness. <laughs> stacks and stacks. But, you know, we have a comment line, so we get feedback from listeners that, oh, I just, you know, heard of this person, or I'd like to hear about this. And it's also, what we're going through, for you know, example, Kathy's daughter recently got married, so guess what we did? We did a show about becoming an in-law, which was really lots and of fun. And how to be a good in-law. Yes. You know, I want my son-in-law to really love me. Right. And how not so. to be a bad in-law. <laughs> right. <laughs> but I have to tell you, from day one, our husbands have been unbelievable resources. I mean, our family, everybody reads the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, I mean, the financial, I mean, Anything we can get our hands on, we read, to find the latest trends, the topics, things that people are really interested in. So, um, we, and our kids, and our kids, who are, our, who are twenty-four they something, all the time. constantly. My daughter sent me one about a sex therapist. So, you know, <laughs> hey. do you think she's telling her something? I'm not sure. <laughs> but we love listener input. If you have any ideas, please. We we. We really appreciate it, and we always try to respond to every uh, comment, personally. Oh, I know, I'm sorry. We did not answer one question where you said if we're influenced by moving from regionally to nationally. A little bit, yes, because since the show is now a more global scope, certainly more national, we have to make it not seem so local. However, we've tried to twist that. Because, after all, this is where we were born and bred, and we love the shore. And there's so many interesting topics and people and jobs and opportunities. So what we try to do is take those and just turn the story into a, a story that will have appeal on a broader level. And we're not really influenced at all by our advertisers. We own the, we own the show, we own the trademark, um, we own the content. Yeah, and the bottom line is nobody, including AARP, which is really what mm -hmm. makes us continue, nobody um, edits our content or tells us what we can and can't do, which yeah. is really nice. So we're not talking heads for an organization. Right. So how does the sponsor work? They, uh, do you just advertise them on the show and we'll just uh, do what we make monthly? Or? Yeah, we actually have a, a, okay, how do sponsorships work? We actually have, we sort of have a um, different sort of business models here going. So we have our website. And on our website there are advertisers. So they actually come on board to, you know, they pay to have a spot on our site. However, we're really, really particular and we don't want to junk up our site so that, you know, when you guys peruse and you go on sites and all you see are ads everywhere, you can't even see the content because there's so many, so many ads. So, we're really careful about that. Another um, model is that we have an e-newsletter, and you can sign up for it. We'd love to have, we'd love to send it to you. Uh, we don't spam, and it goes out to thousands of listeners everywhere, every single week. And it's brand new content. It'll give you a heads up on who's on the show, what it's about, links to their latest best-selling book, or to their site, or whatever it happens to be. And um, that goes out. That's another venue for advertisers. And then there's the national. Yeah. 
Well, also depending on the deal we get with the sponsor, they get a mention at the top and the bottom of the hour, and then they get like a 19 second spot within the show. Oh. And that's nationally or regionally, depending on if they're a regional sponsor or a national sponsor. So we sort of have our own deals with each sponsor, and depending on the amount of money that they, they pay us. Do you have a question? Oh, uh, yeah. Do you have any uh, long-term or short-term goals, like maybe possibly uh, uh, going to another station or going to another show? Um, he asked if we had any long-term goals um, to possibly own another station or another show. Well, <coughs> our goal is, our long-term goal is to really expand our distribution, to be on as many stations as we possibly can. So, you know, there's National Public Radio, and National Public Radio has hundreds and hundreds of stations. We, we are on some NPR affiliates, but we would like to really expand our reach within the NPR, you know, a broader reach within the NPR. Um, we're very open to being on more commercial stations. We are on some right now, but we're, you know, of course there's thousands of them out here. And now we're on Cable Radio Network, which means that you have Comcast, Cox, Time Warner, you know the stations that are like 5,450, it's way at the end, <laughs> and it'll have music, you can play music on your television, or they also have talk stations, so we're in those, and those go all over the place. But um, but the apps we feel, I mean, that's kind of the wave of the future. I mean, how many of you guys listen to iHeartRadio? Is there a big thing that's people? Yeah. Yeah. Or iTunes. Right. Or anything. Yeah. And we are, um, actually, we are working on a, a sidearm of our radio show. And so maybe next year we'll be able to come back and tell you all about it. But it's kind of something exciting that we're working on. It's a natural offshoot. Are you, uh, I have a question. Are you thinking of making another business plan? Like yeah. Are we considering making another new business, business plan? <laughs> <laughs> like your sidearm. Yes, for our yes. side, yes. Yes. we are in the process of writing a business plan right. for our, yes. And we have we learned are. from our experience with this business, actually, that you really do need to have a very specific business plan. Yeah. You need a road map. Yes. And it's not to say that you can't, you know, zig and zag, you know. But you, you have, have to have something to zig and zag. Right. 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 So we, we are in the process that. of developing this business plan. Which, Mr. Filthy, will probably be coming in, <laughs> asking your opinion <laughs> down the road. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, I understand the sponsors and stuff, but um, how, how do you make money? What, how, where does your income come from? Do the sponsors pay your airtime? Do the, does the radio station pay for your show? Where does your actual living income come from? That is a wonderful question, and it took us a while to figure that one out. <laughs> you know, the radio business is a, here's a, how do we make money? Do we sell, you know, do we get money from advertisers? Do, do, how do we, air, you know, how does it all work? Do you want to take it? Sure. Well, since we own our show, so that's the beauty of this. AARP distributes the show, so they pay for the distribution. The sponsors pay us directly. So that is money that goes directly to our coffers, but we have expenses because we are a small business. So that is really where the income comes in. We get a, a stipend from um, AARP as a sponsor. They are also a sponsor in addition to the distributor of our show. So between the two streams of income, that really is how we, you know. And kind of like self-employed. Self oh yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. we are an entity. We're an We're LLC. LLC. We're an entity, we're our own entity. We could have, we have a national contract with the ARP. And our deal with them is they do all the distribution, which is a lot of money. And they do all of the production, which is a lot of money. I mean, it is expensive to be in this business. I mean, it's in the hundreds of thousands of dollars to produce our show. And they, so we have then also, we receive payment from them. So to clarify, it, it's the, the sponsorship's going to the LLC, to the corporation, yeah, right. and then you're paid a salary from the corporation. Well, or yes. Have, or yes. are you doing revenue distribution from the corporation? 
Uh, revenue distribution. Yeah, probably. Well, it's actually yeah. probably more revenue distribution. Yeah. We don't. We don't hear. Yeah, it's probably more revenue distribution. So you're, you're just distributing the profits that are left right. over. Yes, right. That's exactly what we're doing. doing. But we are also under, with our national contract, we are given a national fee for our talent, content, whatever you want to call it. Um, so. It's complicated. It really is. And if anybody is ever thinking of going into the radio business, pick our brains because what we found when we started this crazy thing, nobody would let us in on how it all works. It was so hard to figure it out. But I do have to say, we kind of created this ourselves because AARP has other shows, yeah. but nobody has a deal like ours. The people, the, most of the people that do the shows, they are direct employees of AARP, so they make a salary, and then, of course, AARP does the production. With us, it's very different. So you don't have to share anything with AARP? Well, on, <laughs> <laughs> on, on regional levels, no. And through our e-newsletter, no. Yeah. Through our website, no. But nationally, Broadcast programs, we share revenues. It's complicated. I mean, it's, it's so many levels of, you know, of deals. But I, you probably don't even realize, we didn't realize, but this organization produces so much programming. You don't even really realize. You may see an ad at the end of a show. They probably produce that show. Today's show with Jane Pauley, they produce it. I mean, it, it's, it's amazing the stuff they put out. You yeah. talk about anything controversial on your show? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Like, we've gotten a few it? letters here and there. Yeah, who was the one like, oh, oh, um, really, we got a really nasty letter last Oh, week. I know what it was. <laughs> we interviewed the great niece of Al Capone. And we thought this, I'm from Chicago, you know, this. it was eight years ago. The guy was not a good guy, granted. But she wrote it from the perspective of being a little girl and what it was like to live with the Capone name. Do you all know who Al Capone was? Yeah. The, you know, yeah. the gangster. Yeah. Okay. Have you watched Boardwalk Empire? That's up. <laughs> but, um, so, so she was talking about how, you know, this was very difficult. She had to change her name, and she remembers going to the, the Capone family household, and there would be armed guards everywhere, and she didn't reveal that she was a Capone until she was like in her 20s. But anyway, we got a letter. And, you know, we were just, we thought it was interesting yeah. just because not that, we said that Al Capone was a nice guy, but we thought it was that was an interesting perspective from growing up with that name. So we got a letter from a woman, and we were happy she listened. I mean, that was good. But she did not understand. She thought we absolutely did not, we weren't hard enough on her, and after all, Al Capone was a big murderer, and how could we let her get away with that? And, you know, we sort of have to tip her when we write back. Yeah. And, we understood our reactions, but um, well, we wrote back and we said we thank you so much. Number one for listening. Yeah. Number two for writing in and letting us know how you feel. And then we tried to explain that we simply wanted to present this woman's story, who, after all, by no fault of her own, was born into this family. She was just a little girl when her uncle Al was this big, big, you know, mean guy. And it was just quite interesting hearing her say, I love my uncle Al, you know. He we had his little family dinners. <laughs> so you'll never hold anything back regardless of what you're doing this thing? You know, we don't talk about politics. I mean, yeah. that, is, that does seem to, we, will, we had a show about why people are so divided about politics, but we didn't take a side. I mean, a little glimmers come through, you know, sort of where we might stand, but that seems to be a really hot yeah. button. Topic. And especially in Washington. Yeah. 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 So. What about like uh, other controversial issues like marijuana, abortion, all those Oh, we're going to do that. that. <laughs> you, know, you should even say that. We actually just booked this really cool guy who's the proprietor of Get High Getaways <laughs> <laughs> in Denver, Colorado. And you know, Colorado, you use a, I guess, a, a free it state is, to smoke yeah. in or whatever. And we thought it was really fascinating because talk about a business opportunity. There is a rise in tourism for um, get high getaways, B and B's. So he's going to be on our show and tell us about what they do and you know oh, is how that, they. Is that an idea? Yeah, well, I'm actually doing a business plan on. Something like that. Oh, well, I'd be happy. We can put you in touch with them or just Google oh, Get High Getaway. Yeah.
<laughs> Interesting. Me? Who had the chocolate? Yes. <laughs> you think you I think everybody wants to talk to him. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's a very lucrative business. We have a few people in Colorado. Okay, so, <laughs> so we're gonna have to wrap it up. Um, is there are there any other questions? One more and then um, what my business customers to do. Um, it's just a quick one. I mean, obviously you're, you know, very successful and happy, but other than, you know, the, the obvious things you've mentioned, have, what other personal rewards have you, you know, has anybody ever come to you and said, you know, your show changed my life, you know, but just, uh, what else has happened to you? Change, 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 change. Um, what other personal rewards have we sort of gleaned from the show? And has anyone ever said, like, you know, our, our show has touched them in some way or another? Certainly through uh, the Alzheimer's, it's really cheery when I think of this. The Alzheimer's segment, it really, really, really hit a lot of people. It was probably the hardest thing we've ever, ever had to do because it was so deeply personal. Um, I don't know. Well, I'll, I'll make a real quick story. Kathy and I were at the Salt when we were taking out a Salisbury. And Kathy's car wouldn't start. So we called the Salisbury <laughs> police to come dump the car. So this big girly policeman drives up and he said, Oh, you know, here I have these jumper cables. And Kathy told him finally where the battery was. <laughs> I didn't even know where the battery was. Who puts a battery in a back seat? I mean, no, not really. You know, <laughs> Underneath the seat. in the car for 15 oh years or whatever. I never need to find the battery. I know. So the guy jumps the car. And we happen to be interviewing the, um, uh, the, the Farmer's Almanac. So I said, okay, for your trouble, you know, we just hit this little radio show and we inter just interviewed the Farmer's Almanac guy. We'll give you a Farmer's Almanac. And he looks at us um, and he goes, you're not the Chew Boomer Babe, are you? <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, are we going to be arrested? And I said, yes, we are. And he said, all the guys at the station listen to you every Saturday morning. They love you. <laughs> and that's what we said. He gave us this huge hug. And you know, we thought, you know what? This was definitely, we didn't think our audience or our niche. And he said, the guys get such a kick out of listening to you guys every Saturday morning. And they loved your topics. And they really, you yeah. know, they, they, they learned a lot from us. It was very So cool. that was the ultimate compliment. I mean, that's the kind of thing that every once in a while you get this, this is yeah. why we're doing that kind of moment. And we do get that feedback. It's it's really neat. You know, people blog about it, or they they post something in their sites, the retweets, and whatever. It's very cool. Coolest thing for me is working hand in glove Aww. with my best friend. <laughs> we laugh. We'll be sitting on our lounge chair in Miami Beach when we're 92. Yeah. And if we were late, we did that. <laughs> Thank, you so much. Thank you all. Thank you. happy to stay if you have any questions or anything. I wonder about that marijuana idea. <laughs> <laughs> Barbara. <laughs>